So this happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-30s wearing a baseball cap roaming around my property, with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in the PNW so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point because the dude walks to the side of my house out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard in my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house, etc. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we have hired anyone to come by the house and he says not that he knows of and tells me he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates. Just parked parallel to my front door. The dude still hasn't seen me and he's still wandering around so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system and I armed it, so if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then I get a call back from my dad saying neither him or my mom hired anyone to come by today, and that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end what is happening and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and tells me to talk to them. I called the number she gave me and immediately I got an automated message saying, thank you for calling my town's name non-emergency hotline, nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency please hang up and dial 911. At this point I'm really irritated cause 15 minutes has passed and this weird dude is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone and apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading toward my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange dude. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her when she finally after what seemed like forever alerted police to come to where I was she agreed and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy, and he's now sitting in his unplated Honda either listening to a radio show extremely loudly, or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent loud male voice coming from his car. Then all of a sudden I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you, and the operator is no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back so I picked it up. Instead I was greeted by really creepy heavy breathing, I'm not sure whose it was but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I even could explain it to her. She said the cops were on her way. 20 minutes had passed at this point, the dude is still here in his car, and the cops aren't. Keep in mind I live in a smaller town so there is no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally this dude is leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in, and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy looking flyer saying, it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired. Until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, the cop said it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. So creepy dude who could potentially be posing as a landscaper to traffic people or rob their houses, let's not meet. I noticed that a lot of stories here feature creepy men, so I thought it would be interesting to share mine, that features a creepy woman. This happened when I was 12 years old and in year 8 in Australia. A friend and I played after school hockey. It wasn't a popular sport so our games took place at another school which was incredibly far away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The area didn't have any train stations, so we relied on three different buses to get there, and again to get home. 
The games usually took place pretty late and ended around 7 8 p.m. when it was dark. All the other girls in our team got picked up by their parents, but we always busted together home. We didn't feel it was dangerous because there were two of us and being classic 12-year-olds, we thought we were mature enough to be independent. Because we had to change buses three times, and we lived so far away, by the time we got to our second bus stop it was usually pitch black. The second bus stop was desolate, far out from the school, in front of some kind of abandoned building, and basically a bit creepy. The stop was small and wasn't sheltered, it was just a steel pole with the bus painted on the side. On this particular night, it was raining as well, so we felt extra miserable standing out in the cold. Australian buses are also notoriously unreliable, so it wasn't unusual for us to wait an hour at this bus stop. That night it definitely felt like we had been waiting there over an hour when a car pulled up in front of us. A woman was in it, she rolled down her window and asked where we were going. I told her, the suburb we lived in, which was an HR drive away, and she said she could give us a lift if we wanted. If it had been a man I would have been immediately suspicious and legged it, but because she was a youngish woman, looked about 40 it didn't raise any red flags in my mind. I remember thinking that she must be understandably worried about two young girls standing out in the rain at night. I smiled and thanked her and said it was okay, we would wait for the bus. She hesitated and then drove away. Around a few minutes later she came back and pulled up in front of us again. She told us that her daughter was in a play at the local school, and that she was going there anyway to pick her up, so are we sure we didn't want to lift? My friend was almost about to get in, but I hesitated maybe thanks to my parents drilling me about stranger danger, and I said thank you, but it was alright, we'll wait. She was a bit pushier this time and asked us if we were sure quite a few times and mentioned her daughter again, but she eventually drove away. At this point, I think my intuition was telling me that it felt a bit weird she hadn't mentioned her daughter earlier. Another few minutes later she came back again. This time she said that she had just driven past our bus further down the road and that it had obviously skipped our stop so she offered to give us a lift to try to catch up to it. I wouldn't put it past Australian buses to skip small stops, but it also sounded unlikely to me. By this point, I was super suspicious. I didn't really have time to think so it was a bad gut feeling, rather than any logical reasoning. In hindsight, I questioned how she knew which bus number we wanted to catch and also how she knew the bus route so well that she could follow it and try to catch up to it. With all politeness slash smiles gone, I straight up just said no. I could tell my friend, who was about to get into her car before, was also starting to feel the heebie-jeebies because she backed away from the road. The woman hesitated for a while, it lapsed into an awkward silence and I remember she kept glancing at her back seat. I remember holding my hockey stick tight and playing in my brain how I was going to defend myself. It honestly felt like forever before she finally drove away. A few minutes later the bus came and I had never been so relieved in my life. By this point, we were absolutely soaked. To this day I still don't know whether she was just a worried, good Samaritan or a potential kidnapper. I flipped between the two and I honestly can't decide. My friend also thinks it's a mystery and we don't know if we were just being paranoid. Somewhere around five years ago I lived on a dead-end street with only a few other houses. Our street was situated in an area where the houses and neighborhoods started to taper off and the stores and businesses began. It was tucked away off a busy street and most people didn't even realize it was there so it was pretty quiet and uneventful. At the time it was my husband and I, our son who was around one year old, and our dog living in a massive but rundown house. It had been foreclosed on and needed a lot of work so we had bought it cheap and were slowly fixing it up. Because the house needed a lot of work and so many things were in disrepair different parts of the house had different quirks and sounds that we came to recognize. The back door had three wooden stairs outside that creaked slash groan and shifted loudly when used and the doorknob made an odd rattling noise when turned. We didn't use this door as a way to get into the house much because we had a connected garage that had a door into the house. There is a small hall connecting the back door and the garage access door to the living room. The other homes on the street consisted of middle-aged or older couples. Even though we were the only ones with the child still living at home we got along well and were friends with almost all of them. There was one neighbor who didn't like me much. He was the bishop, pastor, of the local congregation and always tried to get me to attend the church services. I had been raised in this religion but left as an adult because I did not believe in it. I was polite but firm that I would not be attending. This difference of opinions made him less friendly towards me. 
Whenever we would see him he would chat with my husband but ignore or make little judgmental comments to me. I tried to be polite and would wave and go about my day instead of engaging with him. For the most part, we really enjoyed our time living there. One evening my husband was out with his dad to a basketball game. It was probably around 9 p.m. The baby had been asleep for a couple hours and I was in the living room watching a movie. Towards the end of the movie I heard the wooden stairs at the back door creak with use and the doorknob start rattling. I always keep my doors locked and my first thought was my husband, for some reason, decided to come in this door and was jiggling the handle trying to get his keys in the lock but couldn't find it in the dark. Except, I hadn't heard the garage door lift which one could always hear when in the living room. I felt uneasy so I called him. He picked up and I heard a lot of noise in the background from the sports venue. My heart sank and in a last-ditch effort of hope I said, is that you tried to get in through the back door. He told me he was still at the game. I let him know someone was trying to get in the back door, the handle was still being jiggled, and I was going to call the police. I was too scared to approach the door and look outside because the little glass window could easily be broken and reach through to unlock the door. And the thought of being face to face with this potentially violent and dangerous person made me paralyzed. I felt like I couldn't breathe and I might throw up. All my limbs felt tingly and numb. I dialed 911 and told them someone was trying to break in. As I was giving them my address and name and answering all their questions, I ran upstairs towards my son's room. I ran past tools we were using for remodeling and without thinking grabbed a hammer and a screwdriver. I called my dog and she and I stood outside my son's door preparing for a confrontation if necessary. I didn't dare go into his room because I didn't want him to wake up and start crying. I figured crying would make it hard for me to hear if the person got in the house and if so would also alert them to our location. I didn't dare grab him and run out of the house because the properties are larger than average and there are no streetlights. I didn't think I could make it to a neighbor's while talking to 911 and holding a baby if I were to be pursued. I was terrified but would have fought tooth and nail to protect my son. The police arrived very quickly, yet it somehow seemed like an eternity, with lights but no sirens. The dispatch operator had me put the dog in my bedroom and leave the screwdriver and hammer behind while I opened the front door for the officers. I let the officers in and led them to the living room. One stayed with me while the other went to the back door and searched that part of the house. I could see flashlights from other officers through the windows searching my property, about half an acre. The officer taking my statement seemed oddly accusatory and aggressive. As he was questioning me he kept stepping forward so I'd have to take a step back until my back was against the wall. The questions he asked me made it seem like he wanted me to say I'd made it up. He kept suggesting it was my imagination. I felt uncomfortable and anxious. Luckily the other officer came back into the living room and took charge. He was very kind and empathetic. He finished taking my statement and left me his card so I could contact him if anything else happened and explained they hadn't found anyone or anything amiss on the property. I contacted all the neighbors, except the bishop, to let them know why the police had come and were searching the yards. None of them were too worried and a few even mentioned that they'd lived here for decades and things like this didn't happen here. After my husband got home the police left and he called the bishop to fill him in. He asked the bishop to tell the congregation during the weekly announcements portion of the service and remind them to please lock their doors, congregations in this church are organized by location so his congregation was made up of all the neighborhoods in the immediate area. The bishop chuckled and said it was probably just my imagination running wild since I had been home alone, and making the announcement wasn't necessary. What happened later is not the bishop's fault, but part of me wonders if the rest of the story could have been avoided had he taken me seriously and shared the situation and reminder to lock doors. We felt a bit dejected and dismissed by the neighbors not taking us seriously, but that's their choice so we moved on and thought that was the end of it. About a week later I was awake early after feeding the baby and from his room upstairs could see that there were police and patrol cars everywhere. It seemed like every police car in the city was surrounding the neighborhood. I watched from the window as officers searched all the streets and yards in the dim, early morning light. I went about the rest of my morning on high alert and periodically checked the news to see if there was any information. It didn't take long for the news report. In the middle of the night a man had gone into a home down the street for miles through an unlocked door. He had gone to the basement and grabbed a little girl from her room. He carried her up the stairs and out the front door. Hearing her voice upstairs and the door closing woke the parents. The mom called 911 while the dad followed the intruder to the front yard. He got his daughter back and the intruder ran. Police searched the area and were alerted a while later by a woman who found the kidnapper in her basement. 
She had a large doggy door he was able to use to get in. Her house was directly behind mine. Our backyards were separated by a mere vegetable garden. We never found out if it was the same man who tried to get in our house. There's a lot of speculation with his whereabouts and timeline because he was using a lot of drugs at the time. He ended up going to prison for the kidnapping, but the house and neighborhood never really felt safe again. To the person who tried to get in my house, the man who gave a little girl and her family lasting emotional damage, let's not meet. And, I might throw in a small let's not meet again, to the aggressive police officer who felt like I was wasting his time. 